So just how early in the process does a person become a customer? Well, it's earlier than you think, and we'll talk about it on today's episode of The Buyer's Mind. Welcome to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a closer look deep inside your customer's decision-making mechanism to reverse engineer the perfect sales presentation. Now, please welcome your host, Jeff Shore. Well, welcome everyone once again to another episode of The Buyer is Mine. Jeff Shore here, your host, with our show producer, Paul Murphy. Uh, Murph, you know we like to talk about the way that people buy, understanding the way that they make that decision, but we do tend to look at it from the perspective of how do we convert them once they're standing in front of us. But today we need to take a look at how early in the process somebody becomes a customer. Do you have any thoughts on that, my friend? I wish I did. No, um, <laughs> no. I, I think uh, I think we become customers when we fall in love with something. You know, you you uh, think about me, and we've talked about it before. In and Out Burger, um, I am I am now a mm -hmm. loyal customer. Uh, but I became a customer that first time I got my in and out burger and I was like, this is amazing. Yeah, sure. Um, and, and so the experience played a big part of it. But somewhere along the line, you had to be aware that in and out existed. So you probably heard about it from other people because in and out doesn't do a lot of advertising. Right. So that, that, that had to be part of it is that people had talked about it and had kind of. Uh, whet your appetite, so to speak, for what the experience might be like. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, friends and family testimonials play a, a big part of how we initially become customers on things. But there's one other aspect there, and that is the first time you ate at In-N-Out. I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that you were hungry. Yeah, mildly, sure. Okay. <laughs> I was probably pretty ravenous at that point. Well, that's fine. But the idea is that it it all starts with that sense that I have a need before we go any further. And when we track back on that customer's journey, it always tracks back early on to a need. Now, that customer may not be fully behind that need. They may not fully understand that need. It might be a, as you say, a ravenous need. But if there is no need, if they are perfectly satisfied and where they are right now, they're not a customer. There's no reason for them to be a customer. So by the time they actually contact us, show up at our office, call us, whatever it is, uh, it indicates that there is a problem that needs to be solved. But I'm going to suggest that in between that need arising and the time that they walk through our door, there's a whole lot that takes place that needs to be unpacked. And that's why I'm thrilled about today's episode, because we're going to look at it as, and, and try and find out what happens in the very early stages of that customer's buying behavior and how our marketing efforts, our social media efforts, and our sales efforts all line up to help us take that person who has an annoyance, a pain point, a dissatisfaction on the one hand, and get them into the active uh, process of shopping and interacting with a sales professional. How do we bridge the gap? What happens in there? Now, if you're a sales professional, I'm going to suggest you that this is very, very important for you to understand, because if you know about the customer's journey before they walk through the door, it's going to inform the way that you're going to both talk to them and ultimately the way that you're going to see them, the way that you're going to uh, appraise them, the way that you're going to uh, get a sense of what their journey has already been like. But the idea that somebody just oh, have to be walking by and said, I'm just looking, this is foreign. That's not the way it works. So what do we want to do? We want to be able to look at it and understand our customer's journey on a deep enough level that we know how to take care of their needs. That's what we're going to get into today with our special guest, Kevin Oakley. All right, joined now by uh, the, just a, a really, really smart guy when it comes to the way that people think online and how we get them to transfer their online behavior to actually interacting, showing up, making a phone call, whatever it is. We know that customers lurk in the background, but what's going on in their mind when they do? And we've got an expert on that subject. Uh, he is uh, one of the most, just the most foremost authorities on, on how people think and the online uh, activity and behavior. And we're thrilled to have him on the show from Do You Convert? The one and only Kevin Oakley. Kevin, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic, sir. Thanks so much for having me on today. 
And, and you're you're coming at, you're calling in from uh, Columbus, Ohio. Is that correct? Columbus, Ohio. Yes, indeed. The the home of the Ohio State Buckeyes. Th no, that's a that's a recent thing for you. Just moved there. Are you already <laughs> like uh, the Ohio State? Are you that obnoxious guy now? I am, uh, but I did grow up here, so I, I oh, did was you? in okay. Pittsburgh. I was in Pittsburgh for eight years and quickly became a Steelers fan. When I moved there, people were very concerned. Uh, are you a Browns fan or a Bengals fan? To which my reply was, do they play football on Sundays in Ohio? Because I was not aware. <laughs> so I was a free agent and quickly became a Steelers fan. There you go. That that worked out for you. Yeah, yeah. And now I have to tell you, uh, you know, I, I've 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 spent a lot of time in Columbus, uh, but it is on the bucket list to get out to a Buckeyes game on a Saturday in the fall. It just seems like one of those experiences that you can't even describe. You have to actually be there. Jeff, we call that the absolute best kind of business expense possible. I have a completely <laughs> open invitation if anyone wants to come attend an Ohio State home game. I will pay for your ticket. You just get here. I love it. I love it. Fantastic. All right. So let's uh, dive into this. I want to, we're going to talk about uh, just sort of the typical customer, if there is such a thing, Kevin. <laughs> and um, I just want to start by looking at what point do you consider to be the start of that typical customer shopping experience? I mean, is it even, is it even possible to accurately claim that someone is what we would say in the market? Absolutely, there is. And from a marketer's perspective, and, and how this translates down the line to salespeople is that what really counts as the start of, of that shopping experience is the moment that their reticular activator begins to make them hyper aware of something, a need, a want, a desire for something to be made easier in their life, something made better in their life. You know, you know a lot about that. And that's the fertile ground when the messages and influences as a marketer that we're trying to push out there actually have some ability to grow. You know, the hardest part is not getting people's attention in today's world. It's keeping it and making them care about what you're saying. And so this is why this radical shift has happened where, where old marketing techniques no longer work is you can't just shout at people. You know, uh, the great Seth Godin talks about the industrial complex and, and, and the way that TV and radio and these fascinating things were meant to push one message out to everyone. And now you, their shopping experience begins from a marketer's perspective when they actually start to care about something. And, and then when they're doing research online now, artificial intelligence and algorithms are fantastic at deciphering when someone is in the market based upon online behavior and search activity. All right. So, so, you know, I, I, uh, you know, we could look at, uh, you know, the, the reticular activator, we could look at what happens in the, the very base stem of our brain. Uh, I tend to put it in, in, in pretty approachable language when I say that we see something, we like something, and then our gut, which doesn't have a verbal language, but if it did, it would just say, want, want, want. Is that what you're describing as the start of the shopping experience? Exactly. When, when a message has an ability to penetrate a brain because someone already has a want or a care about it. You know, when, when your wife is pregnant, you and her both see pregnant people everywhere. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to media, especially mass media, a very small percentage of the total audience is actually interested in that message. And so that's the beauty of online and, and search, because what you just said is when I need something, want something, where do we go today? We go to really one of three places. We go to Google, we go to Amazon, or we go to our network uh, on social media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's, does it imply though, that uh, if that's going to happen, there's already a need. I may not have fully identified what it is. I may not even mm -hmm. have agreed with myself that it's there, but it seems to me that it has to indicate some sort of need, some sort of pain point, some sort of dissatisfaction in order to activate that want, want, want experience. Absolutely. And the example that I agree with you completely, they, they may not, consumer can't articulate that. Mm -hmm. You know, when I first saw the um, amazing bicycle system that is the Peloton, I yeah. didn't know that I wanted an exercise bike. I, I knew in the back of my mind that I wanted to get healthy. And so then as I was consuming all types of different media and content online, offline, everywhere, I started seeing this bike appear and then I was being remarketed. And then I was typing in search terms for what is the best home exercise program. Right. And so it all, it all definitely is still a little muddy. It's not as clear as we'd like it to be. But once someone starts really being able to articulate, even on the fringe edges, what it is they want or desire, 
then they start telling their closest friend, their closest confidant, which is their cell phone, exactly what it is they're looking for. <laughs> and then marketers jump in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I uh, it, You and I were talking offline just a little bit. I am now in day 17 of a digital detox and uh, taking a break from uh, uh, social media activities and, and games on my phone and, and uh, YouTube and everything else just for a 30-day sort of mental cleansing. And uh, I've suddenly found the need for puzzles. Uh, the, the, my wife and I have gotten back into puzzles here. The problem is, uh, I don't know where to, where, where, what's a good price for a puzzle? Where do you find a good puzzle? But there is that need that sort of kicks in first, and then it drives us into the discovery along those lines. And I think we just discovered, regardless of what you're buying, whether it's uh, something like a $10 puzzle or a, a, a $500,000 home or anything in between, there is still that, uh, that want, want, want. It, let me let me ask you this: uh, When you, you you sort of ride on a fence between two disciplines, uh, sales and marketing, right? We we mm -hmm. often the companies often have the sales and marketing department. Are they two disciplines, or are they just two sides of the same coin? Really, one uh, discipline. How do you separate the difference between marketing and sales? To me, marketing's role is to serve sales. It is a servant position, right? Marketing's job is to procure, to find and bring to sales, qualified prospects to have real conversations with, and then to circle back around and help support and nurture that relationship along, especially in today's digital world, but at the direction of the salesperson. So what you have is from a, from a high level perspective, marketing is in charge of strategy and, and advertising and communications to get that person in front of sales. And then at that point, sales is now in charge of the strategy and needs to be in constant communication with marketing because marketing, now that it's personal, it's one-on-one, -on -one, marketing can no longer broadcast to many. It has to be a one-to-one -one conversation. And, but we still have to help nurture that relationship in ways, you know, your, your salesperson's not going to create their own remarketing ads. So sales has to, and usually through the form of a CRM system or just having good conversation back and forth, has to constantly keep the flow of information back to marketing on their interaction with the customer so that marketing can really help. But at the end of the day, I see marketing as serving sales. Now, Another kind of fun analogy that I like to use is that uh, a thoroughbred racehorse analogy. You know, marketing is the jockey, jockey oftentimes in the overall consumer relationship. But the second that the thoroughbred racehorse, the salesperson, the sales team feels the bit in their mouth, you're, you're in big trouble. The, the mm -hmm. horse is going to buck you off and say, no, no, I'm, it's my muscle that's getting us to the finish line. And so there has to be this, again, great connection between sales and marketing in today's world. Uh, the fantastic quote that Mike and I use all the time at Do You Convert is, you know, the dysfunctional relationship between sales and marketing is the kiss of death in a modern economy. Mm -hmm. um, and so marketing can hit home runs, right? One great marketing action, change in process campaign could potentially change your sales results for a year or longer. And salespeople must be really excellent at hitting singles. You're never mm -hmm. going to typically sell 10 products to one person on one day. Right. But you have to be really good at making sure every time you get up to bat or as many times as possible, you're hitting a single. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about where social media falls into this. Do you consider social media to be... Uh, a marketing tool primarily, or, or I mean, I, I know we're sold on the idea by the by the Facebooks and the Twitters of the world that no, no, we're a connecting tool, and yet organizations <laughs> know full well uh, that uh, Facebook, Twitter, they they make their money off of marketing. Is social media a a, a viable, long standing marketing tool? Um, it is a means to an end. So it's a great mm -hmm. way currently to connect with customers in terms of the the viable long term that will obviously change as as the ebb and flow of consumer behavior changes and our trust level with social platforms in particular but we do have this weird relationship as marketers and salespeople where we say kind of like with advertising this doesn't really affect me i i'm rise above what is on my screen and i make my own decisions and uh but at the same time we're vehemently concerned that Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter are going to change the outcome of an election 
or mm -hmm. overthrow, uh, you know, a dictate has the ability to overthrow a dictator in a foreign country, right? So we have mm -hmm. this dichotomy of we we don't want to believe that it has an impact on us currently in our lives and in the, in the way that consumers think and act, but it absolutely does, and it it has potentially the biggest single influence on a consumer if the purchase value is lower. So I, I just want to talk for a minute about two different perspectives. On a high value purchase, the impact of social is pretty clear. It's on reviews, ratings, and recommendations that you're going to get from your own network. When it comes to a purchase decision, not consideration or just trying to formulate what it is that you want as a consumer, but when you, when you are getting close to making a purchase, you're going to social media to get reviews, ratings, and recommendations from, from people that you trust within your network. Uh, for high value purchases, the, the marketing impact is higher up the funnel because social media does have in today's world a tremendous impact on what products and companies make the short list on a more complex sale, whether that's a car, vacation home, new construction home, whatever. If it's a longer cycle, higher value purchase, it has tremendous impact today on what company is going to make the short list. But for lower value, you know, you're selling jeans, you're selling uh, sticks of gum, whatever, like social media can oftentimes today be the beginning and the end, except for the asterisks of Amazon, uh, it's a huge part of it. But you know, if my wife sees an influencer on, on Instagram talk about a great sweater, that sucker's purchased in five minutes or less mm -hmm. with no consideration mm -hmm. about alternatives, with no consideration about the cost of uh, opportunity, right? It's just see it, buy it, deliver it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's talk about uh, shift gears here just a little bit and talk about a uh, uh, the online behavior of someone who is interacting with a product online long before the organization, the the company even knows that that's happening. They, they may be able to track and see that there's activity out there, but they don't know yeah. what it actually is. Uh, and then there's the opportunity for somebody who is browsing, looking at a product, uh, and then they go to the contact me page or the ask about page or, or hey, you mm -hmm. know, if you want to fill this out, then we'll be happy to send <laughs> you whatever it is. And yeah. I'm always intrigued by... Uh, I think marketers call it the bounce off rate, the percentage of yeah. times people, you know, so you're, you're online and you're, it, it says, get a free quote, right? So you're, you're putting in all your information that says, great, thanks for all that information. Now just give us your name, address, phone number, social security, and credit cards, <laughs> and somebody will be in touch with you in the next 24 uh -huh. hours. And of course, yep. you know, if you're like me, Kevin, you can't bounce off of that page uh, uh, quick enough. So then yep. that causes me to look at it and say, if somebody does fill out that information, this is just huge. I, I mean, the, the, the message that they're sending is absolutely stunning. Talk a little bit about that, that contact me page and how it tends to be incredibly undervalued, especially by frontline salespeople. Yeah, it, it is huge because you're right. We're, we're even seeing, Jeff, that, that a lot of people will bounce off that. Uh, one to two percent, three percent, if you're really great on a general website for any type of product would be considered a fantastic overall conversion on that contact page. So the people who go through that pain certainly are heavily motivated to want to talk to someone to help them or to get more information. And yet every time that we do shops, uh, seeing how oftentimes how, how often those get responded to, the vast, vast majority, over 70 percent, never call the phone number provided. Uh, mm -hmm. and very rarely less than 3% will send more than two emails and make one follow-up attempt. And in today's busy world, it requires more than that often to cut through the clutter, even for a really motivated person. But Jeff, the other interesting thing that we're seeing as a big shift over the last two years, and you think about today's millennial and younger buyers, especially how weird does it seem to them if they're really interested in something to fill out a form and wait for a response? <laughs> like I talk about now, you know, to me, microwave popcorn was amazing, but we're so impatient as a society that now we pre pop the popcorn and put it in a bag. So that the actual time from I want popcorn to I have popcorn can be about two seconds. Yeah, right. And so what we're seeing now is that that page still has tremendous value, but for a lot of the companies that we work with, two thirds of their leads are coming from a page like that but they are opting instead of filling out that complicated form and waiting, they're saying, no, 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 talk to me now. 
Mm -hmm. I want to text you. I want to talk to you on the phone. And so that's a big shift from where about two years ago, two thirds of the leads coming into a business would come from a form completion. Now we're seeing that complete flip flop to if I'm, if I'm a good prospect, I'm going to reach out now, which, which is another challenge because uh, again, at Deacon we say good salespeople are too busy to follow up or answer the phone and bad salespeople don't. Mm -hmm. And so right. now which, that which we have even nobody more volume up. coming in yeah, or answers right. the phone, not even follow up, but when that mm -hmm. phone is ringing, right. if you yeah. can't answer yeah. it, you're in big trouble. How mature is the, the consumer's decision before they have any kind of direct interaction with a supplier, uh, you know, I'm I'm always trying to get a sense of how far along a a buyer is in the process, without a salesperson ever knowing that they even exist, let alone let alone mm -hmm. what their interest levels are. Yeah, and the reality is that a lot of consumers today would prefer to go as far as possible without that interaction because of the fear, right? That you talk a lot about that visual image of the sleazy used car salesman, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what they're all expecting to interact with. And so they want to go as far as humanly possible down the line. And if you want to encourage the more of those people to reach out, then, then here's the one key to success. Just pull over, write this part down. All you have to do is get complete transparency on your website about all transactional information. Anything that is transactional, factual, black and white information needs to be discoverable at some point on your website. But it has to be combined with enough intensely emotional content to overcome the fear of being stalked by that used car salesperson. So if you want people to reach out sooner or more frequently, you have to have, I, I kind of picture this invisible dashed line and the consumer's emotional excitement when they're on your website. There has to be enough transactional information to say, yes, that will solve my problem. And then enough intensely emotional content where that, that line goes up and above that dash line of fear and says, okay, I know I may interact, I may interact with a sleazeball used car salesperson type of personality, but I don't care because I'm that excited emotionally about this product or service that can meet my needs. Um, he, he, let's let me just give a little pushback. And make sure that I understand this right. When you talk about yeah. having complete transparency uh, and, and being able to give people everything they need, at some point, do you run the risk of so overwhelming your customer's brain that it just locks up? We had Barry Schwartz on the uh, podcast recently. Yeah. Said, Paradox ask of people what they want. You know, they say they want choice. Give them a lot of choice. Their brain locks up. They can't make a decision. Absolutely. And so you're, that's a good clarify, clarifying point for sure. It doesn't have to all be valued the same in terms of visual layout, placement on the site. It doesn't all have to be front and center. In fact, it should be very uh, straightforward. And that's one of the problems we see on sites is that people don't know what the next step is. Mm -hmm. uh, they just want to know, what do I need to do next if I'm interested in this thing? But somewhere on there, you know, you need to be able to, if they want to be self-serving enough that has to be located somewhere on the site. Because if not, uh, in, in the real estate scenario, uh, if I'm working with a home builder and they say, we don't put the exact square footage of a home on our website because we think that's confusing and we don't sell by square footage and price, you know, the, all kinds of different objections. Well, it's really strange though, when I go on Zillow, it lists the exact square footage. So mm -hmm. what the home builder is training their consumer to do in this case is if you want complete transactional information, you're going to go to someplace that is not the home builder's website. And that's a dangerous thing to train the consumer for. So if they, if they want to push forward far enough, Jeff, to find it, it needs to be able to be found. But at the same point, your overall uh, layout and design of the page can be very simple and straightforward because I completely agree with the paradox of choice and, and all the studies that they've shown that you do have to make it easy and simple at the same time. Yeah, I, I had a similar experience here just, it was yesterday, as a matter of fact, a, a business lead that came in and I went to look at this organization, what it is they do, and they had all kinds of information on their website, except for pricing. There was absolutely nothing about pricing. And I thought that that was really, really interesting because I, I couldn't even get a broad range of the prices that they were asking. And and so yeah. now, as you say, what are you going to do then? You're going to challenge your 
customer to go find some other source because if you're right, and I believe you are right on this, that customers prefer to uh, go as far as possible without the interaction, then they'll go to any source they can find just to be able to get a sense of, is this even in my price range before I get started? So uh, I, I agree. There's got to be enough information there to be able to to hook them in and, and feel like you know, they're, they're, they're being transparent. Um, now, but with that now, with this abundance of information that we have available online, we surely do. How how do you feel that's changed the uh, the role of the salesperson? When I first started in sales, you know, I have to tell you, I was trained early on with the idea that you know, knowledge is what is it? Come on, what's knowledge, Kevin? You know what it is? Power. Knowledge is power. So I was trained. You know, the last thing in the world you want to do is give your customer all the information, and so I would hoard it, and I would say, you may have this piece of information, and you may have this piece of and. I'm going to hold on for this one. I might be able to use it later when I need to be manipulative to get the sale. And that's, I mean, that's the world that I grew up in. Well, now, guess what? The rules completely changed. The information is out there for everyone. So how has that abundance of information changed the role of the salesperson? Well, the most important thing, and again, you're talking to someone whose primary love is marketing. I love sales too, but from a, from a marketing and branding perspective, Salespeople are the single most valuable part of a brand. That human interaction, that face-to-face -face experience is the single most valuable part of a brand or the culture of an organization. Why? Because we can't replicate and duplicate androids who are going to behave exactly the same way. So it takes a lot of training. It takes a lot of time. Uh, and it takes a lot of finding the right people to be on your team. And so when you think of the term brand equity, what makes a brand extremely valuable Chick-fil-A's brand is extremely valuable, not because of their logo, their colors, their store layout. It is because they have trained thousands, tens of thousands of people to treat their customers as if they're the most important thing in the world at that moment to, to them. I have to just and jump so, in parenthetically and say yeah. that that's exactly the example that was rattling in my brain as soon as you started to talk. If you had never walked into a fast food restaurant in your life and uh, and you know you walked into uh, three restaurants in a row that had all opened on the same day, uh, just by the trappings and the surroundings, you really wouldn't know what you were getting. Uh, and yet this brand loyalty to Chick-fil-A is so profound not because the food is that, I mean, it's a good chicken sandwich, but so what, yeah, it's a chicken right. sandwich. But the experience <laughs> is just absolutely amazing. And and it speaks to the idea that uh, those representatives are the most valuable part of the brand. Sorry, but that's exactly where my head no, was at. And that. it's so, so powerful that the last time we were in Chick-fil-A, I asked my wife, I said, Melanie, does Chick-fil-A make people nicer by who they are? Like they attract nice people to come <laughs> buy chicken in the store? Yeah. Or is is the branding in their experience making us want to be nicer? I don't know what mm -hmm. it is, but everyone is nice in Chick-fil-A now. It's not just the employees. But you know, the, the most important thing that a salesperson can do today is to deliver on the brand promise. Absolutely. And, and how do you do that? Obviously by being likable and by being caring and all those things, but also when it comes to this massive amount of information, by providing clarity. So not all of this information is it can't be possible for our all to be equally important to you, the customer. So let me get to know you intimately, as intimately as possible, so that I can provide clarity on what features, benefits, details, factual bits of information are important to you to make a good and informed decision. And then the other thing is to provide context, because you might now, Jeff, be a much better at describing what makes one puzzle better than another. But now, how do you tell that to me? Uh, Kevin Oakley, who has done one puzzle in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. You can give me lots of factual information, but you're going to have to give me some context and, and do some storytelling and some in investigation about my likes and interests and how much time I want to spend on the puzzle. And at the end result, does, does that impact me? So it's clarity, context, and delivering on the brand promise that that helps build that trusting relationship where you can let the sale roll out right in front of you. Are there companies out there right now that you just enjoy watching their marketing approach? Oh, absolutely. But what's interesting is that almost all of them, I don't even have to name them because that that's like a, uh, a conference joke. You hear all the same companies over and over right. again. We all know who they are. Yeah. But what they're doing, and it's interesting to me that no one is catching this that's not these companies, 
is they're shifting ad dollars to experience dollars. And it doesn't matter if it's a store, if it's better training, uh, better recruitment, um, better clothes that, that are being provided for folks to wear, better customer service, easier return policies. All that stuff is marketing, but it's not advertising. And mm -hmm. that's, I don't know why it's so hard for more comp. I do know why, because advertising is a drug that you feel like you're getting a return on until you're not. Um, but we should be investing in, in the experiences throughout the entire buyer journey, not just running ads. Yeah, there's that sense of of how we as consumers anymore. Well, even when you mentioned Chick-fil-A, I'm not a huge Chick-fil-A guy. I, I live in the West Coast. I'm a big in and out guy. Uh, but mm. but we own a part of that brand, right? We we want and we want to own a part of the brand. And I I think about my subscription to John's Crazy Socks. And what's great about it, you know, here's John, this Down syndrome kid who loves socks, and his dad says, you know what, we can we can make a business out of this deal. Uh, but then what happens now? Here you see pictures on social of John testifying in front of Congress about uh, uh, just about the plight and the journey of of Down syndrome. Of adults in the United States today. And then you see that part of the money that you're paying to John's Crazy Socks is going to support the Special Olympics and the great work that they're doing. And, and you're all just a part of that. You're you're wrapped into it. You you take a sense of ownership that goes well beyond the socks. And to me, that's a company that does uh, uh, d has it all right, because if you go to johnscrazysocks.com, and no, they're not a sponsor, I'm not getting paid to say this, <laughs> but if you go to the website, johnscrazysocks.com, right from the very beginning, you'll have two choices. It'll say, hear the story or buy socks. That's yep. it. And how simple mm -hmm. is it for you to go to what exactly you want, whether you want to be wrapped up into the journey or whether you want to buy socks and they make it easy to do what you want to do anyway. And I think that's what you're talking about is how do we shift that into more of an experience? And so then what happens in the mailbox? It's a red sort of foil like envelope. It's like I get a Christmas present every month and there's the socks. You never know what they're going to be. And there's a little tiny bag of Skittles because John loves Skittles and a little note handwritten from John. Hope you like the socks. And it's it's just, it's a beautiful, beautiful story and a great picture. Uh, and by the way, about a company that's making money hand over fist. Yeah. I mean, they probably have a hard time keeping socks in stock. Yes. If you're right. not part of that regular subscription service. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Very cool. Uh, great stuff. Just great stuff. Hey, before we let you go, uh, we're going to put you on the hot seat though. Rapid fire questions, no, rapid fire awesome. answers. You ready? Let's go. Yeah. All right. Your very first job was what? Uh, tech support for internet call, call an internet service it was terrible <laughs> they had the internet when you were young I, I, wow that's amazing or maybe you yes. just started your career late i don't know all right and 80 uh, percent of the time it was can you please just check and make sure that your computer's plugged in that's and right I was, exactly i was a and, genius and, yeah and and the teenager isn't using the phone that you're trying to uh, get a, a through your modem there all right exactly. um, an album from your youth that you listen to over and over again oh garth brooks uh Broken Fences, I think, is the name of the album, but All one right. of the Garth Brooks early albums, yeah. Love it. Uh, the most beautiful place you've ever stood? Uh, that would be at Atitalan in Guatemala. It is three volcanoes and a lake, and mm. it's stunning. Love it. Um, any book that you've read that's made a profound impact on your life? Oh, man. Um, I would say Lynchpin by Seth Godin. Just such a great uh, Not book. an uh, advertising if... book, but yeah. fantastic. That doesn't matter. If Seth Godin wrote the phone book, I'd read it. It, it wouldn't matter. <laughs> uh, a movie you've seen multiple times, but you can't help it. You have to watch it whenever it comes on. Oh, any any of the Star Wars movies. Oh, sure. Any of them. Okay. All right. And uh, your first celebrity crush. Oh, it would be Karate Kid's girlfriend, Elizabeth Shue. <laughs> that's awesome all right you're off the hot seat uh kevin <laughs> oakley with do you convert you can go to do you convert.com uh read the blog follow the podcast and enjoy the work of uh, kevin and his crew over at do you convert kevin thanks for being on the buyer's mind absolutely it was a it was a total pleasure all right, Murph, there you go. Kevin Oakley uh, just is such a good guy and just a really smart guy. And, you know, here, I'm a sales guy, right? I've always been on that sales side. And uh, I think... I think Kevin really compliments me well. He understands sales, but he really sees the world through a marketing lens. I understand marketing, but I see the world through a sales lens. And I think that makes it easy for the two of us to talk together. 
And I don't come from either background, so you got to help me out. Reticular activator. What in the <laughs> what? Is that the want, want, want? Uh, well, in a sense, it is. I mean, the 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 reticular activator uh, really, or it's really the reticular activating system, and it's just a it's a bundle of nerves right there at the the base of the brain. It's part of the very primitive brain uh, that is that is going to activate, and that's the key word, activate, uh, when something catches our attention, and our brain asks the question, "Should I pay attention to that?" And at the core, the purpose was uh, to be a Aware if a, a saber toothed tiger jumped out from you know behind a bush somewhere and it caused you to say okay what am I going to do fight or flight so yeah the key purpose of that more primitive brain was just to sort of keep us alive but now uh, here uh, uh, you know sometime later we're looking at it and saying w just what gets my attention in general what what activates uh, the very basic part of my brain. Well, I appreciate that because uh, obviously that's why I need to be hanging out with you smart guys to learn this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it, it is uh, it's it's fascinating stuff, and it speaks to the idea that there is a science behind it. We're not just going to throw out you know an ad or a website or a, a, a billboard or a, a flyer and say there it is. Surely this is going to get you to buy. And I think more and more we're just learning that uh, uh, we've got to activate the brain. We've got to try and figure out how to activate the brain on areas that are. And Kevin was just talking about this on ways that are far more experienced. When we get holistic in the way that we activate the brain, we're, we're far more effective along those lines. I thought it was interesting, too, Kevin's take on the idea that customers prefer to go as far as possible without interaction. Uh, did that ring true to you, Murph? It does. Uh, I mean, myself, I find myself shopping on the Internet and uh, I, I want, like he talked about, you know, you got to have all the information there. If it's a call now for the price. I'm out. I got to, mm -hmm. I I don't want to call. I want to know what the price is. Um, you know, and, and start making decisions based on the information that I'm able to find. Well, I would look at it from the perspective that if customers really do want to go as far as possible without interaction, and I, I'm that way too, I think we all are to some extent, right? There's a fear. You're putting yourself out there when you're going to fill out a form or make a phone call or go visit a place of business. There's a fear that's going to click in. And so we are going to want to do our homework. We are going to want to try and figure out how far can I take this before I have to engage with somebody. But what that speaks to me is the idea that when I do engage with someone, well, what's happened? It means now that I have exhausted the limits of what I can do on my own. So from that perspective, when I am going to engage with someone, what am I really doing? I'm asking for help. I'm going to the point where I'm saying, that's it. I, I've I've tried to get as much information, whether it was on your website, whether it was on uh, uh, Yelp, whether it was t on social media, talking to friends. I've exhausted my avenues to try and learn as much as I can. And now I need help. This is where you come in. So if you're a frontline sales professional, you want to look at it from that perspective. By the time you are talking to a customer, it's not just that they have been online. It's not just that they can see a little bit about what you offer or what your competitors offer. By the time they talk to you, by the time they fill out a form online, by the time they make a phone call, send you an email, or walk into your place of business, by the time that happens, what they are doing is asking. They're requesting your assistance. We can't blow this off. We have to look at it and say, that's significant. There is something special happening there. That customer is already way down uh, the, the road on this journey. It's a great perspective to adopt, thanks to Kevin. One other thing that Kevin said that I thought was so great was the idea that salespeople are the most valuable part of the brand. And he talked about it from the perspective of Chick-fil-A, which is a great uh, example. But again, you you could go through all, as uh, Kevin said, the, all the conference speakers talk about the usual suspects, right? The Apple and the Southwest and the In-N-Out and all of that. Uh, but what makes all these places uh, different, it is the people. It, it is the fact that the salespeople themselves are the most valuable part of the brand. And when someone is dealing with your company, they're not dealing with your company. They are dealing with you. 
and you were carrying the banner. You were setting the cultural tone of their entire interaction. That's a heavy weight to carry, but great salespeople say, bring it on. I am more than willing and more than able to be able to do that. When that customer walks through the door, they're going to leave with significant opinions about everything based on their interaction with you. We've got to take that seriously. We have to value that. We have to appreciate that. It's the only way that we can truly take care of our customers. It's the only way, ultimately, that we can change their world. 